reality, yes. I mean, we've already spoken about the uh, the loss of the vote of confidence in, in 1979. The Jeffrey Howe speech was another of those amazing moments. But, I mean, I go along with Chris, although, you know, his typically understated views <laughs> about Margaret Thatcher. I try my best. <laughs> I don't quite, don't quite go there. But um, I, I think it's the one of us that was my problem with, with this book, because um, Harris uh, was speechwriter, advisor, um, a sort of partial ghostwriter of the autobiography. And he keeps on popping up in footnotes, which I, I must say I did find quite annoying that the... Uh, the course of events is outlined in the page, and then, wow, there's a footnote saying, oh, and I was there at that meeting. And it slightly, it robs the book, I think, of... Objectivity. A, a lot of credibility, I would say, because he also puts in really waspish remarks, which I don't think um, uh, are, he seeks, or indeed succeeds, in justifying. I mean, on the, the How resignation speech, he says, it was a better performance than he usually managed. Yes, that's Which right. I thought was catty in the extreme, but it was just another throwaway. At one point, he says, um, Heseltine's pride was as swollen as, as his ambition. And I think when you've got that sort of thing uh, just coming up oh. as obiter remarks, mm -hmm. it... it it robs all, it all, those, all those phrases about the Labour Party wound me, me up <laughs> even more because it's similar sort of stuff. But actually, there's another detail I thought he left out, which which often gets left out of the story of the of the vote in 1979, the vote of no confidence. There was a strike in Parliament at the time, so no catering staff were working in Parliament. There was no food to be had anywhere. But the Tory Whips office had got this sorted because they got in loads of hampers from Fortnum and Mason to make sure that their colleagues stayed for the vote. Hey, Chris, I simply don't remember that. <laughs> well, you probably you weren't in the Tory Whip's office. I don't know, but I will. Well, the word, you know the jungle drums at, uh, in the House of Commons, they beat very loudly. There were bits in the book that I found I just did, simply didn't agree with, and from somebody who purported and who claims, both in the frontispiece and on the back of the dust jacket, to be so close and to be the nominated, the anointed autobiographer, I found this quite odd, for example, when Robin Harris said, Mrs Thatcher wanted out of Europe complete when she signed us in. Mm. And then that she, she did absolutely nothing for... I mean, although she did at one point joke, what has feminism ever done for me, to say that she did nothing for women and the role of women in Britain is, is, is just so dismissive of her achievements. And then this other... That was the bit the, I, I did think agree with. <laughs> <the conclusions, laughs> yes, but even, even just by her example, you know, we can't go through all that again because we went through that when she died. But then this bizarre passage towards the end when he says she was in fact a cavalier rather than a roundhead. And I'm not sure that rang true, that she was very pro-monarchy and aristocracy and field sports. I sort of feel I didn't summarise what Mrs Thatcher was. No, I think there was more of a revolutionary well, in her. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, there were some interesting contrasts. I mean, he, he notes that in 1974, she was perfectly happy about government intervention to keep the mortgage rate down, yes, yeah. which I thought was quite an interesting uh, aperçu. Uh, Chris talked about luck. Um, there's one uh, episode which is really downplayed in the book, which I know something about, which is the whole Westland affair. Mm. And he mm. says, oh, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. <laughs> she thought that it could be the end of her premiership. And I do know something about it, because I was clerk of the Defence Committee at the time, and I wrote the report. Um, and she was lucky twice, because not only was the, were the events of the Westland affair compartmentalised, as it were, politically, but also when the Defence Committee's report came out, and it was, uh, it was very care I can tell you, long hours of writing and reviewing the evidence, but it was very carefully evidentially based. Um, that was another moment of hazard. And had the opposition of the time mounted a more effective attack on her, I think that luck would have been shortened. I'm not saying it would have run out. I think it's one of the things I generally feel about quite a lot of political books, which is that um, the, the chamber, the drama of the chamber, is rarely rendered either accurately yes. or emotionally effectively. Yes. Um, I, I think that's also true, actually, of, of television news and all the rest of it. Uh, um, but... You I can think of there. so many moments. Yeah, there, there are so many there. moments where you sort of had to be there mm -hmm. to be able to write that, um, and then, but then maybe you're so involved that you can't write in an unbiased way. Mm. But does Hans Hart doesn't even convey the drama of the chamber? It actually just deadens it usually, doesn't it? No, but there's a great moment, yeah. uh, not in this book, completely different era, in fact, um, but when Asquith is addressing the House of Commons and the key debate on, um, the, uh, on the, in the battle between the House of Lords and the House of Commons on um, the 1909 budget 
It is absolutely, we know now from Churchill's letter to his wife and Lloyd George's letter in Welsh to his wife yeah. that, Ch that Asquith was completely and utterly <laughs> drunk. <laughs> drunk as a skunk. Uh, and, and you had to be taken out of the chamber and didn't vote that night. However, but tradition. if you look at Hansard, yeah. it just says, Balfour says something along the lines of, I'm glad he tried to speak to us this afternoon. <laughs> and, and, but he used a very odd tone and things like that. So afterwards, you could, you could read Hansard. What's the and, Hansard euphemism for drunk? Is there one? Uh, I, well, no, because Hansa you doesn't, doesn't describe people's deportment, <laughs> no. as it were. But, I mean, not for nothing was Asquith's nickname Squiffy. Yeah. Um, and, well, of course, there is the great, the great story yeah. of Asquith making a two-hour speech on the licensing laws, Hansard sending down for his notes, and up comes one piece of paper which says not so many pubs on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got to move on at this point, and, uh, and we've got to turn now to Rachel's choice. And, and you've chosen the final volume of uh, Tony Benn. Yes. Diaries, a blaze of autumn sunshine. Now, is, is this the, uh, the fascination of, of one emerging political dynasty with another here? Oh, goodness, no. Come no, I mean, I, I, I've written two volumes of diaries myself, which I wouldn't dream of plugging here. But um, I'm really? very... Go no, on, no, 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 go no. on. <laughs> You'll <laughs> you are not going to plug. No, no, I'm not going to. Because <laughs> neither of now? them are very political. Um, but I think that the diary form is, I think it's, he's a great diarist. Yeah, and, yeah. and it's, one, I, in a sense, I picked this because this is going to be his final volume. He's signed off now. And it, I've chosen this for, for that reason. I think it's a lifetime achievement pick. And also because he, and he lives in the same semi-sheltered housing block as my mother. And I think that there's this lovely um, connection there, which is Tony, Bl Tony Ben, you know, this great, you know, <coughs> old Labour, Labour movement figure whose career has spanned, you know, almost a century now, he's 90, they're above, the, you know, the Tory mayor of London's mother and there they are having their mince pies together and their mulled wine and, and shooting the breeze about, you know, why Ken didn't make it as mayor. Anyway, so I've picked this because it's very pleasurable reading, mainly, I think, because of his hatred for Tony Blair. So John Rentoul has got his work cut out. I mean, if more people read Tony Benn than John Rentoul, um, he literally hates the man. He says the man's a menace. Um, he says he's undermined the whole Labour movement. He, he clearly makes Tony Benn's flesh crawl, and he regards him as entirely responsible for the mess we're in on Europe, on civil liberties, on Iraq, on, on various other things. And when I, He really does not mince his words which makes it a great read. It's also a very personal book, obviously, it's a diary. You have this sense of him sitting in a chair at the end of the day with this dictaphone and basically wrapping up his day. He, he's brilliant on sort of summarising world news. He'll say the big news of today was this happened or, you know, this ghastly Tory was elected mayor and, you know, it's all over. And then there are lovely touches, like he says, well, these are the old, these are the ramblings of an old man approaching midnight. And I think that sort of sums up the book. It's not the ramblings of an old man approaching midnight. It's the ramblings of a great political figure who's going to go down in history as he signs off, really. And I think it's really worth a read. And he's got this slightly odd transformation that's overtaken him from the, the years when he was kind of the demon king of British politics, reviled in most of the press. And suddenly, along the way, he became a national treasure. And mm. I'm not sure he's altogether comfortable with that, but it's a very odd transformation. Yeah, he sort of suffers a bit from what I call late-onset celebrity syndrome, where he sort of says, and I met this famous person, and then this film star rang on my door, and then I was rung up by... He's got various obsessions, um, that Natasha Kaplinsky and Saffron Burroughs and sort of, you know, Bianca Jagger. You know, these, these people but, but pop up time after time in the diary. I thought the very first sentence of the book sort of slightly gave that away. I was dozing off when Kofi Annan rang. Yes. <laughs> oh, darling. That's a normal <laughs> day a in, Tony Benz, in the life of Tony Benn. Oh, no. And he has dinner at all sales. Oh, they put me on Carter's right. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, you know, exactly. that, that yeah. may well be, I, I would say, it is his um, uh, deserved reward, but it, they come up. I find it actually rather charming. I it, do. It's not, it's not name-dropping. Yes. It really is how it It's happened. sort of name-dropping. Yes. I remember when, uh, when, um, when George Carey had become Archbishop of Canterbury, he was preaching at the college where I was uh, training to be ordained, and he started a sermon by saying, the Pope said to me the other day... <laughs> 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 oh, 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 oh,
name drop. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, one of the things about Tony Bent was that he said he left Parliament to spend more time on politics. But the fact was he was awfully good in Parliament, wasn't he, Robert? Uh, I think he was. I, I think he... My knowledge and encounters with him over 40 years, I think, have been characterised uh, by his extraordinary courtesy and his interest in what's going on, mm -hmm. which comes out um, vividly in, in the diaries, and which he has passed on in very good measure to his, uh, to his family as well. I mean, mm -hmm. Hillary is one of the most courteous politicians you yeah. could possibly find. And yeah. Emily, who is clearly going to take forward... Is the she an MP yet? No, no. 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 But she was adopted as a candidate yeah. when she was 17, and yeah. so actually too young. Right. <laughs> and yeah. I think she said at the Labour Party conference, didn't she, um, hang on the, the election for another year until I can actually mm. stand. But I'm intrigued by this dynasty thing, because it's been such a part of parliamentary history, actually, that some families, for some reason or other, if you've already got one in the family, then it's easier to have another one in the family. It's like, because so, it's not just his dad, his son and his dad, but his grandfather and I think his grandmother's father as well, if I'm not yes, mistaken. Yes, you're right. So mm. quite a few. I mean, whereas we've got Laura Sands in the House of Commons now and everybody goes, oh, well, Duncan Sands, yes, you know, Churchill's um, sidekick. But more importantly, he goes way back to the 14th century Archbishop of York, I think, Miles Sands and Edwin Sands in the 16th century and so on. She's got like 30. And politics is in the DNA is what we're saying. Yeah. But what I love, one of the best lines in the book is when he says his father said what he couldn't stand about the House of Lords was all the goodwill, you know, that courtesy. <laughs> You could see why he wouldn't want to do that, where everyone's constantly deferring, and you know, you know the honourable lord and all the rest of it. But again, this this yeah. uh, luck thing, because Tony, of course, um, his his elder brother was killed, wasn't he? Mm. And that, and yeah. so the, the, his father had said that he would only take the viscountcy if. Um, his son was his older son was all right about it, but then his older son was killed, and so Tony had to take the viscountcy, lost a seat in the House of Commons, and all that battle mm -hmm. that we know about. But the government then changed the law, and it was in their own interest in the end because uh, just about the first people to take advantage of being able to renounce your peerage were uh, Quentin Hogg, uh, Lord Hailsham, um, and Lord Douglas Hume, both of them, so as to stand for the Conservative Party leadership. One of the things that, that's interesting about Tony Benn is the the, the ideology, if you like, the things he argued for for so many years seem so desperately out of date now. It's like reading a, you know, an H.G. Wells novel where you know, like his what, vision though? of the future is that he's going forward to the balloon works and the Institute for Workers' Correction. And you look at sort of mass nationalisation of the commanding heights of the economy, there's practically no one who would argue for that now, even in Parliament. He still does, because I did any questions or question time with him, and he got a huge clap when he said, you know, we should renationalise all these various industries, and he would point out that even Mrs Thatcher wouldn't want to sell off Royal Mail, which we've just done. And you I know, got a huge yeah. boo from an audience when I said that I, we, Labour had no plans to nationalise um, the energy companies. Uh, but, but I bet you, the moment we adopt... But I think if you we were should. To, but if we I think you'd be very popular if yeah, you did. But you wouldn't then vote for us. Um, yes, I would. <laughs> Because I you think promise? that people want just a basic low-cost energy. They don't want to have to shop around and switch providers. They want energy to be like air. Oh, I wonder. Oh, it's, I think it's I'm wonderful a... to have the perfect excuse to stand <laughs> well back from this. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let me put you on the spot. The old is still back in is what that little discussion. But there's said, also a wonderful bit where he talks about China and he starts rejoicing. He says socialism is returning to or communism is returning to China. I mean, he is just remains true to his old Labour roots. I mean, he's I think but, he's like stick of rock this man. But actually, as a Isn't minister, he? he was immensely pragmatic. Was most it? of the time. If you read, read a lot of Labour history, most of his time as a minister, um, he was immensely pragmatic, and that's the bit that I admire in him. But now he's no longer in politics, he can revert, yes. you see, which is why he loathes Gordon Brown. He said he didn't have a Labour bone in his body, and he loves Ed Miliband because Ed Miliband sat at his knee and, you know, imbibed Tony Blair's Labour philosophy and why he has no time for Tony Blair because he saw Tony Blair as a Thatcherite. Well, at that point, I think we have to move on to someone who predates all these arguments. Uh, Robert, you've chosen uh, Douglas Hurd and Edward Young's biography, Disraeli, uh, which has a rather interesting subtitle. Or The Two Lives. I indeed, and that was actually part of the fascination. I can tell you there was also a tactical element because we have Thatcher, Ben, and as somebody who has to be uh, completely professionally impartial, I thought it was probably safer to go two centuries back for my choice, which I did. But 
Disraeli has always fascinated me. Um, he's a contrast between the statesman and the mountebank. He got there against all the odds, and perhaps there mm. is an echo of Thatcher mm. there, uh, mm. because he broke and several and yeah. luck, yeah. because he broke several moulds in the process. Uh, Jewish MPs, of course, only got into the House of Commons in 1858, but he was uh, baptised when he was 12, was baptised as a Christian. Um, the introduction describes him as a, a bankrupt Jewish school dropout and trashy novelist. You know, how can that? produce uh, a statesman. Now, I would say almost that Disraeli wasn't a statesman, but he was the most expert practitioner of statecraft that you've ever come across. And his combination of strategic insight with fantastic diplomacy, the way that he handled Queen Victoria, mm. the way that he gave her the empire, the Indian empire, so that she wouldn't be upstaged by her daughter-in-law, the Empress Elizabeth, of course. So there was quite a bit of um, rather, um, uh, rather intricate manoeuvring about that. Um, Heard and Young come down on the side. They, they deal with the two lives, I think, very, very effectively. And they come down on the side that uh, at the heart of his political beliefs, the two things which are absolutely indispensable, not just for an individual in terms of political greatness, but also for a nation, are imagination and courage. Mm. And I find that really quite um, I I inspiriting. Um, now, there are all sorts of terrible things about Disraeli. I mean, an ego the size of a planet. About four years before he came into the house, he wrote in a letter to a friend, um, uh, I could carry them all before me. Nothing would be so easy. Um, and when, of course, he was elected and he made his maiden speech in 1837, dressed in a bottle green frock coat, great pantaloons, a white waistcoat hung with chains, he was hulled down and famously said, the time will come when you will hear me, not shall, but will mm. hear me. Um, but that contradiction goes throughout his career. And one of the things I think that he, he, he reaped a premium from events that he wasn't really wholeheartedly creating. He's given the credit for a lot of social legislation, for the Second Reform Act, for example. He was powerfully uninterested in the first, and in the second, he saw it as a means of gaining party advantage. Well, well, and on women's votes, he sort of um, cut his cloth several different times, didn't he, to, to make sure that he didn't have to... He, he subscribed to it, in theory. He, he but, certainly did, and actually, now that was one of the things that I picked out. I, there was an absolutely extraordinary thing for a 19th century politician to say, there's nothing in life like female friendship, it's the only thing worth having, and he said, Anybody in Barmston thought that as well, but well, like, in a different way. Well, no. yeah. <laughs> there were at one time seven society, London society hostesses who, it was said, could have the business of the House of Commons changed in order to accommodate one of their dinner parties. And Palmerston was said to have had affairs with four of them. Yes. Uh, but he, uh, Disraeli said, talk to women. This is political advice. Talk to women. Talk to women as much as you can. This is the best school. This is the way to gain fluency. They will rally you on many points. And as they are women, perhaps this was a bit of uh, um, uh, embedded prejudice, as they are women, you will not be offended. But the starting point, I think, was fantastically open-minded. Mm. I've always wanted to like Disraeli, because I like that, as Robert says, that, that element of courage and imagination and the ability to be a writer and, and in, uh, thoroughly immersed in the world of politics and, and also his vision of... Um, the problems in Victorian society of the gap between rich and poor. Um, he didn't actually use the term one nation. No. But, he said uh, one nation, two nations. Two nations, two nations yes. 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 That's yeah. exactly. rather the different. subtitle of the novel, isn't it? But, yeah. um, but nonetheless, I, I, I mean, I think those are pretty good novels and stand the test of time. You haven't read them. Come I, on. I have. I, I swear to God, I have. You're, you're a greater Sib man than I you've am. Read Sib I've read Sib All the two nations. Yeah. 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 I mean, that, yeah. That, that, that's a great one. Yes. Uh, however, the problem is he lied. He did. He lied quite a lot. And, and most importantly, he was utterly wrong and treated Robert Peel shamefully. I've just finished reading um, Douglas Hurd's biography of Robert Peel, mm. which I actually thought was better than this. Um, but uh, but in, there's this terrible moment where basically um, Peel says, but you were looking for a job only a few weeks ago um, when, when uh, over the uh, repeal of the Corn Laws... Uh, um, 
Disraeli is attacking Peel um, and Peel's government, and, and Disraeli fervently denies it. And we now know yeah. that Peel That's had true. the letter in his pocket and never chose to deploy it. Yes. Um, it's, I, but wasn't I, it, that pay, all payback for not being included in his in the administration? But why should he have son? been? Well, I don't know, but you know, people get you know people bear grudges in politics. But, but he did bend. Yeah. I mean, because yeah. Robert referred to what he wore originally in Parliament, which was rather yeah. flamboyant, shall we say? Um, later on, he went for a very more yeah. modest and, and um, sort of statesman, supposedly more statesman-like. Uh, Outfit, I, but he had such a phenomenal turn of phrase. Often. I thought it was a very um, entertaining book. I mean, I, I'm always distrust two header books to do dual, dual bylined books, but I've no idea how much Heard wrote and how much the other, the co author wrote. But I thought it was beautifully done and really readable. Yeah, it's one yeah. of the things about uh, dis, dis, sorry, I do, no, interrupt, don't, uh, do interrupt. Dis, Disraeli's rhetoric was his great strength. He utterly destroyed Peel with a series of speeches in the House and Peel never really recovered from that. And I'm just wondering, is there any modern politician you could compare, both on the sort of rhetoric and perhaps on the opportunist side? The only uh, comparison I could easily think of was perhaps an, a certain touch of Tony Blair, not so much for the rhetoric, but the kind of magical ability to be with the public mood that, that Blair had at his peak. I'm not sure that Disraeli had that. Uh, he was a fantastic performer, but he was a fantastic performer on quite a, a narrow stage. Uh, and I'm not sure that modern um, sensibilities would be happy with some of the things and the way that Israeli said, said them. I mean, he said to uh, Lord John Russell, you are now exhaling upon the constitution of your country all that long-hoarded venom and all those distempered humours that have for years accumulated in your petty heart and tainted the current of your mortified life. Now, that is great invective. I'm not sure that we would think that did much good for politics. I agree with Robert, incidentally, about um, rhetoric. I'm not sure that rhetoric is a great um, ability in the House of Commons today. Uh, I, I, I would say that the best public speaker in Parliament today is William Hague. I very rarely find myself taken from one point of view to another point of view by a speech that he makes, because I don't find him very persuasive. They can be amazingly funny. Tony Blair, however, often could take you with no great particular, there were no very few sentences that you would say that was a wonderful sentence, beautifully crafted. But nonetheless, I thought he could often be far more persuasive. I think, though, for my money, you're all going to love this. I think <laughs> George Galloway is one of our is one of our <laughs> best speakers <laughs> because you know he has the ability. I mean, I think you're you're wrong because how many Disraeli quotes are in now books of political quotation? So many compared to almost. Anybody else? So it's not just empty. It's not quotations. just empty phrase making. These phrases actually have. They're not empty symbols, are they? He had meaning at what he said. No, Rich, I, I yeah, absolutely I thought... didn't mean that they were empty symbols. Right, I, or they clashing were symbols or whatever the phrase is. <laughs> well, they, they, were, they were fantastic, uh, fantastically effective pieces of insult, invective, mm. wit, which he quite clearly gloried in because he knew it was so good at it. Yeah. Um, no, I'm, I'm not worried about that. I think that it, the difficulty comes in projecting that onto the canvas of modern politics and the yeah. things that what, we understand. beyond the chamber? And, uh, beyond the chamber, beyond, actually, beyond the middle of the 19th century, um, mm. because it was a, a, a contemporary fashion. Anybody who spoke for four hours in the Commons today would be getting the bird after about an hour. <laughs> but, of course, the Commons in the 19th well, century was but totally different. But wasn't it also Disraeli who had this lovely sense of trust that... In the end, the English people, what was it, the sublime instincts oh, uh, of an Oh, my dear Abercorn, exactly. tell them we, we, we intend to rely on the sublime, sublime instincts, instincts of, of an ancient, ancient people. people. <laughs> so, therefore, in a sense, what happened in the chamber should only reflect what was going on in the country rather than the, the chamber uh, yeah, mm. dominating what, what should go which, on in which the country. Which brings us rather elegantly, on, on, I'm afraid, <laughs> to our next choice, which happens to be mine. And uh, it predates Disraeli a little bit. It's Lady Antonia Fraser's rollicking account of this country's first sort of tentative steps towards uh, what you might call a recognisable parliamentary democracy in the Great Reform Act of 1832. The book's called The Perilous Question and it describes this titanic parliamentary battle with a threat of revolution lurking in the background. There's a marvellous moment where Lord John Russell, one of the central figures in the drama, reads out to Parliament the list of common seats to be abolished to the very MPs who are going to be abolished with them and they're all there sitting across the chamber with their arms folded as he pronounces a kind of political 
political death sentence upon them. That's one of the many, many moments of considerable drama in this tale, because there was a sense that the country was teetering, as it were, on the, on the brink of a bit of an abyss. I mean, Chris, you're, you're a historian of Parliament. What did you make of uh, this tale? Uh, well, again, another vote won by a single vote, isn't there? The first um, Reform Act is carried by a single vote in the House of Commons. Everybody, and of course, in those days, it was the old House of Commons before the fire, so voting is a completely different system um, where the eyes go out of the chamber and um, the nose stay in, um, and then they're, they're counted, that, the, the eyes are outside accounted and the nose inside accounted um, and incidentally if you you had to be in the building otherwise you weren't allowed to take part in the vote and if you were in the building you had to vote there, there are occasions later in the 19th century where people tried to hide um, because they didn't want to be counted on either an I or a no and they were forced um, into one of the into an, uh, being an I or a no um, so some of that I think is, is rendered very well and um, th that goes to my argument that a lot of British history is not actually some great tide of history that was inevitable but uh, an awful lot of luck um, uh, all along the way. My favourite example of which is 1713 when people tried to uh, remove all ministers from the House of Commons. Um, it would, the bill was just fell because it got to third reading the House of Lords and it was, it was a draw. Um, otherwise we'd have been like the American system withdrawing, taking the executive out of Parliament. Um, so I liked all of that about it. There are bits which I just think are wrong. Um, I don't think she understands how the House of Lords worked in the 19th century um, um, uh, very well. Um, some of the characterizations of individuals, I think, are a little bit uh, wobbly. And I, I would have liked to have seen a bit more of the role of the bishops, actually, because in the House of Lords, they were a substantial body. When the, I think it's the first reform bill loses by 41 votes. If the 21 bishops had voted the other way, um, then it would have been carried and we wouldn't have had the massive confrontation that there was. I found it, it was... It's anecdotal, it's gossipy, nothing wrong with that. Sometimes I think she finds it very hard to control the material and you slightly lose the thread. Chris is absolutely right about not understanding how the House of Commons worked. With the first reform bill, the, the big debate on which there was not a division was seven days on the motion for leave to bring in the bill, which is was the start of the legislative process in those days. You only see it these days as a ten-minute rule bill. But she misses that out completely. She calls it first reading and passes over it rather quickly, but it was actually an extremely agonised and extremely important um, set of exchanges. And then she concentrates on second reading. I was really sorry that on second reading, she, that on the vote, she didn't use Macaulay's fantastic description of what it was like with the tellers coming back into the chamber. he was in there as an MP himself. He was, he was indeed. The jaw of Pe Peel fell and the face of Twiss was as the face of a damned soul. <laughs> and uh, he, 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 and there's, there's much more, but she, she doesn't use that, unfortunately. But she is very good, yeah. I would say, about the world outside Parliament. Um, affecting what was happening inside Parliament and the petitions that were pouring down on yes. the House of Commons and the House of Lords yes. and, all, and, and the whole sense of there being a world out there um, which did infect um, what was happening politically, uh, uh, not least because people's houses were having their windows smashed and um, bishops' palaces being burnt down and, and you know, the, mm. the conflagration mm. in Bristol and so on. And one of the funny things about it is that, to some extent, it was framed as a struggle of the peers versus the people, but actually the, the Whigs, the party who were in power, who were promoting all this, were actually rather grander <laughs> and had more aristocrats, really top aristocrats amongst them, than did the Conservatives. I mean, that, that strand of... of Aristocracy in politics is one of the most interesting they things. They were in sort of costume, didn't they? Wear a special blue jacket, didn't yeah, they? The Whigs wore, wore and buff waistcoat. And buff yes. I mean, I felt, I don't know. I mean, that I wish that she had, in a sense, written this after the Tories failed to get their reforms through the House of Lords recently, because how we are still, how parliamentary, how the outcome yes. of, oh, of yes. elections is still can be determined by great reform bills or the failure of them to pass because, you know, many people are saying that, you know, the Tories now can't get a majority because we didn't get the boundary changes through the Lords. So, that therefore, this comment. notion of, you know, who is returned to Parliament is still an absolutely mm. critical mm. factor in the determination of the nation. But this family thing, yeah. you're absolutely right about the Whigs because so many... He, she calls them the, the cousinhood, doesn't she? The, the Whig cousinhood. Yeah. Cause, 
uh, uh, people will get me, uh, correct me if I've got this wrong. So, um, Gray, in Gray's government, you had um, his two sons-in-law. Um, and what, actually, one of the key moments, which I didn't know about, to be honest, is Gray's grandson's death. Yeah. Yes. One Boy of the key red. moments. Boy in red. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, which is, which is, it reminded me again of Asquith, actually, uh, you know, in the, in the First World War. It's only a few weeks after Asquith's um, oldest son, Raymond, dies that he is evicted mm. as Prime Minister. And maybe Churchill and Lloyd George felt they were able to remove him because he was emotionally so crushed. And, and I think the, that interaction of the deeply, deeply personal, um, with the, like, Durham clearly goes bonkers at one point. Um, <laughs> yes, so that interaction with the deeply personal book, with the political is interesting. I we, find we, we, we do, I fear, have to move on at that point because the clock is ticking upon us. And so, uh, just as a final note, I wanted to get each of you just to, to add a stocking filler, just in case some of our viewers have read every one of these books <laughs> and are hoping against hope they'll recommend something else as well. Uh, Chris, what have you got for us? Uh, well, I read a novel on holiday. I love reading novels on holiday. Eduardo Mendoza. It's in translation from the Spanish. An Englishman in Madrid. It's set um, just before the Spanish Civil War, and it's fascinating. It's got art, it's got humour, it's got politics, it's got the drama of a fascist government. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating read. Rachel. <laughs> I'm too embarrassed, but I think I am going to recommend my own diary, as I didn't, <laughs> as I didn't plug it at the beginning. Oh, I would like to commend to all viewers the diary, a diary of the lady, which is my account, my turbulent account of my struggle to dominate a small circulation weekly magazine with the premises in Covent Garden, London. Ah, and Sir Robin. Well, any suggestion I can make can only be an anticlimax <laughs> after that, quite frankly. <laughs> I, my stocking fellow, and it will have to be quite a capacious stocking, is the blunders of our government, governments, which is a quotation 18th century from the 18th century burgeoning American state. But it's a story of cock ups, but cock ups from which the That's authors. Not parliamentary, you can't say that. <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> 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 cock ups from which the authors draw lessons. So I think it's required reading. And they do actually. Um, they give good. Um, they give a, a, a reasonable um, hearing for things that were actually successful. The one thing that I think is a really interesting conclusion is they um, say that the real hazard lies in anything on which both parties or all parties, both major parties, agree. all parties agree absolutely. Ah. That way, disaster lies. My heart always <laughs> sinks when people start saying yeah, this is this shows the House of Commons at its best because <laughs> we all agree. Therefore, we must be right. No, it's a place of <laughs> challenge. <laughs> uh, my, my, my final offering as a, as a stocking filler is Matthew Dancona's In It Together, the um, uh, account of the inside account of the coalition. Uh, it's, it's got a certain flavour of this is what my mates who I was at university with told me about what was really happening in government. And perhaps it doesn't quite have some of the wonderful inside stories that Andrew Rawnsley's insider accounts uh, brought out from, from the Labour years. But then I don't think the personal politics inside the coalition is anything like as gaudy uh, as New Labour's. the Andrew Adonis book about the creation of the coalition, as it were? I think that's oh, yeah. a fascinating yeah. uh, little... And it's not a big book either, which is a great advantage for a stocking. Yeah, a nice seminal book to finish with. And it only remains for me now to uh, finish my uh, pro to finish this program by thanking all my guests for, for coming along. Uh, Sir Robert Rogers, Rachel Johnson, and Chris Bryant, thanks very much indeed for joining us, and a very merry Christmas to all our viewers and a thoroughly literary New Year. <laughs>